This is the last vehicle of its kind. Body on fully boxed frame, solid front axle, full floating rear axle, locking differentials, coil suspension, an inline six, a vehicle that can do just about anything, except for passing other vehicles or a gas station. And Toyota will never build another Land Cruiser like the 80 series Land Cruiser. History overview. It's hard to tell by looking at a modern Land Cruiser, but they were originally bare bones, utilitarian off-road vehicles designed to go anywhere. I'm only gonna go back a couple generations to the FJ55 Iron Pig to follow the bloodline to the 80 series Land Cruiser. The FJ55 was built from 1967 to 1980. And although it looks utilitarian by today's standards, that's just the way SUVs were built back then. And I can't even really call it a sport utility vehicle because there wasn't really much sport involved. The FJ60 was introduced for the 1980s and it brought luxuries such as an automatic transmission, air conditioning, and a rear heater while still being rugged enough to tackle any off-road terrain. The facelifted FJ62 was introduced later that decade with fuel injection and quad headlamps to give the aging 60 series a refresh to keep up with other SUVs. Then the 80 series hit the North American market in 1991. The 80 series continued the 60 series gravitation toward luxury with a more forgiving coil suspension instead of harsh leaf springs and a modern plush 1990s interior full of luxuries. Unfortunately, the US market didn't get a lot of them, such as the rear AC or the center console ice maker, but it did get full-time four-wheel drive. The styling was more rounded and smooth, and even though it rode on a coil suspension now, the 80 kept the solid front axle and would be the last North American Land Cruiser to have a solid front axle, making it the most off-road capable Land Cruiser with modern luxuries. The 100 series that came after the 80 switched to independent front suspension. Although there was the 105 series, a 100 series body with the solid front axle that was available in Australia and Africa. More on that later. Year changes. The most significant change for the 80 series Land Cruiser was in 1993 when Toyota upgraded the 155 horsepower 3FE to the 212 horsepower 1FZ FE engine. In addition to 57 more horsepower, 1993 also brought 16 inch alloy wheels, rear disc brakes, and a full floating rear axle, and was also the first year that the infamous optional front and rear lockers became available. The 80 always had a center locking differential to complement full time four wheel drive, at least in the North American market. Overseas, there were 80s available with part time four wheel drive and manual locking hubs. The next big change was in 1995 when OBD2 was introduced, along with a redesigned dash and airbags. The easiest way to spot a 1995 was the front grille now had a Toyota logo instead of the Toyota letters spelled out across the front. The A442F bus transmission used in 93 and 94 was also replaced by the A343F in 1995. Yes, the A442F was used in the Toyota Coaster, a 30 passenger bus. Some argue it's stronger than the A343F, but the truth is both of these transmissions can handle anything the 1FZ FE can throw at it. And that brings us to the Achilles heel of the 80 series drivetrain, the 1FZ FE. The dual overhead cam 24 valve inline six provided a much needed power boost to the 5,000 pound 80 series Land Cruiser. But with that also came the dreaded head gasket issue. The 1FZ FE uses an iron block with an aluminum head. That's two different metals expanding at two different rates, sharing a large surface area. And the only thing separating them, a composite gasket. The gasket lasts around 200,000 miles on average, which is probably why you see a lot of Land Cruisers for sale at around 200,000 miles. The four liter 3FE and the 91 and 92 80 series may have been underpowered for the application, but they have a strong reputation for being reliable and can easily pass 300,000 miles before any major work is needed. They were backed by the A440F transmission. Both the 3FE and the 1FZ FE are very thirsty 
only getting about 12 miles per gallon city and 15 miles per gallon on the highway. But let's not forget the 4.2 liter diesel engines. First, there was the naturally aspirated, indirect injected 12 valve 1HZ, which, although not powerful, is known for its reliability, simplicity, and parts availability. Then there was the turbocharged, direct injected 12 valve 1HDT, providing a much needed boost in power, although not as reliable, as these boosted engines are known to consume lower end bearings. It was replaced by the turbocharged, direct injected 24 valve 1HDFT with better fuel economy, a couple more horsepower, and a bump in torque of about 16 pound feet. But it was only available for 95 through 97 model years, making it more difficult when it comes to finding parts. Unfortunately, none of these diesel engines were available in North America. Let's talk about rust. As with any Toyota from this era, the frame, suspension, and body of the 80 series Land Cruiser are prone to rust in regions that use road salt. If you're shopping for a clean 80, stay away from the Northeast and Midwest. Living in Ohio, rust was one of the reasons I went with an imported 80, because Japan doesn't use salt on their roads. Lexus LX450. In 1996, Toyota got smart and slapped the Lexus badge on the Land Cruiser, increasing the MSRP by about $8,000. The LX450 got higher quality leather and wood grain inside, along with a nicer stereo and auto climate control. The suspension was a little softer and the exterior had lower body cladding. The wheels were nearly identical with an extra groove on the spokes of the Lexus. The grille and headlights were slightly different from the Land Cruiser, making them non-interchangeable parts. But mechanically, the two were nearly identical. 105 Series When Toyota replaced the 80 Series with the 100 Series Land Cruiser in 1998, it was praised for its more comfortable independent front suspension, more powerful V8, and modern safety standards. Well, at least in the US, by the majority of owners who were never interested in driving off-road. While the hardcore off-road enthusiasts still preferred the solid axle of the 80 series, some regions got the best of both worlds, the 105 series. The 105 series was the body of the 100 series mounted on the chassis of the 80 series. So the engine was the 1FZ FE Gas 4.5 inline six, or the 1HZ non-turbo diesel, both less powerful than the 2UZ V8 of the 100 series especially the 1HZ, which only put out 129 horsepower. So the 105 series wasn't fast. It also wasn't as luxurious as the 100 series, having fewer features and a more simple interior. The 105 series was the more utilitarian version of the 100 series and allowed the 80 series drivetrain and solid front axle to live on an additional generation where it was used to traverse the jungles of Africa and the Australian outback. However, there was one other place that the 80 series continued to be produced, the Venezuela 80 series. In Venezuela, the 80 series Land Cruiser was produced until 2008. Many of these were stripped down to the bare essentials compared to some of the Japanese models or the LX450. Some of these featured a carburetor, sealed beam headlights, vinyl interior with a split bench seat, rear barn doors, steel wheels, and no fender flares. Just like in other parts of the world, these were available with part-time four-wheel drive with manual locking hubs and a manual transmission. One great feature is that they're left-hand drive. So look for these to begin being imported to the US after 25 years or Canada after 15 years. Quality. Without a doubt, the 80 series Land Cruiser was built to last a lifetime. These things can take some serious abuse. However, there are some areas that will need attention as the mileage gets higher. We already talked about the head gasket issue on the 1FZ FE. One more thing that will make any 1FZ FE owner cringe, the dreaded pesky heater hose. I already made a video showing how to replace every single coolant hose and line on the FZJ80, including the pesky heater hose. It's a long job, but with a lot of vehicles still running the original 25 plus year rubber hoses, replacing all of them is something that shouldn't be overlooked. 
especially because if one of them fails, there's a good chance of overheating and that's not going to help the life of the head gasket. Behind the engine on the firewall, the two metal coolant lines that go under the body to the rear heater are notorious for corroding. Replacing them means removing the transmission for access. So that's why I showed how to bypass them as most people choose to do instead of dropping the transmission. There is also a section of the engine harness that sees a lot of heat from the EGR and over time the insulation will deteriorate and eventually damage the wires. Other than that, just keep up on regular maintenance and there will be some oil leaks including front and rear seals and the valve cover. Another big job, not quite as difficult as the coolant lines and the pesky heater hose, but a lot messier, is rebuilding the front knuckles. Over time, the seals will start to leak grease, and if the molly grease in the knuckle gets too low, the Burfield joints will wear excessively. My neglected 80 only had about 85,000 miles when I bought it, but because the previous owners let the grease get too low, both left and right Burfields were clicking on sharp turns. I'll put a link to that full rebuild video in the description. One common cause for leaking knuckles actually starts with a clogged differential breather. When the axle and gear oil warms up from the friction of normal driving, they expand and the warm air can escape through the diff breather. When that is clogged though, the next path of least resistance are the oil seals on each axle. When gear oil gets pushed past the seals, it mixes with the molly grease and the knuckle making it thinner and more likely to leak. Also, when the axle and the air inside it cool and contract after parking, air can't enter through the breather, so the mix of gear oil and molly grease gets sucked back through the oil seal into the axle and differential. If you change the gear oil and it looks like army green brownie batter, this is probably the cause. The last thing to look out for when buying an 80 is rust. Just like any Toyota from this era, winters and road salt will destroy the body and frame of these vehicles. Once the rust starts around body seams and spot welds, it's nearly impossible to remove without cutting out and replacing sheet metal. The fully boxed frame will get surface rust, but also rust from the inside out. This is bad because the rust causes the metal to scale and fall off inside the frame where it gets trapped and blocks drain holes, which holds in moisture and causes even more rust. We saw an example of this in my Toyota frame repair video, which I'll link in the description. To prevent rust on my 80, I spray inside body panels, the underside and the frame, inside and out, with fluid film. I have videos on that process as well. I've already made a video of all the little quirks and minor annoying issues of an 80 series Land Cruiser that owners get used to living with. I'll link that one in the description to help keep this video short. Off-road. When it comes to off-road capability, the 80 series Land Cruiser is one of the most capable SUVs straight from the factory. Add the optional front and rear locking differentials to the standard center locking diff, making it triple locked, as 80 series owners say, and you're ready to tackle most off-road terrain. The 91 and 92 North American Land Cruisers came with 265 75R15 tires on the 15 by 7 inch alloys, while the 93 and up 80s came with 275 70R16 on 16 by 8 inch alloy wheels. In other parts of the world, steel rims were also available as standard equipment. 285-75R16 can be fitted to the stock 16 by 8 inch alloys at factory height without any rubbing on body or suspension components. I have these on my 80 and it comes out to about the same height as a 33 inch tire. A 2 inch lift is all that's needed to fit 35 inch tires without any rubbing. There are plenty of aftermarket kits if you want to go bigger. Overlanding. With its solid axles, heavy duty frame and suspension, and massive 91 cubic feet of cargo space, the 80 series Land Cruiser is an excellent choice for an overland build. There's a wide selection of cargo racks, rooftop tents, and drawer systems available in the aftermarket. 
Toyota was well aware of this capability and actually offered an optional overlanding edition of the 80 series called the Active Vacation Package. If you were into camping or overlanding back in the 90s, then this was the setup you wanted. These came loaded from the factory with all kinds of goodies like a folding shelving unit with built-in storage, it had a fold-out sink and gas stove, plus a fridge in the back, full curtains that covered all of the windows, and it still retained the second row seats so you could haul the whole family. They're pretty rare to come across. I'll put a link in the description to one of those that sold on Bring a Trailer a while back. Value. Back in the 90s, luxury SUVs weren't a huge market segment like they are now. Here in North America, we had the Jeep Grand Cherokee Limited, Land Rover Discovery, Mitsubishi Montero SR, Ford Explorer Limited, and Isuzu Trooper LS. But these were all smaller size $30,000 SUVs that, although loaded with options, weren't in the same league as the larger $40,000 Land Cruiser with third row seating capable of seating seven or eight passengers depending on the year. The Nissan Patrol was a direct competitor to the Land Cruiser, but was never available in the US. And although well built, its traditional boxy styling definitely didn't scream luxury SUV in the 90s when everything was becoming smooth and rounded. The only real competitor to the 80 series Land Cruiser in North America was the Range Rover. The luxurious Range Rover was still more pricey and unfortunately became better known for their unreliability and expensive maintenance. I mean, when was the last time you saw a 1990s Range Rover on the road? Compare used prices of all the vehicles I've mentioned, and there's one clear winner when it comes to holding its value in the used market. As with most vintage Toyotas, 80 series prices started to skyrocket in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. People just wanted to get away from it all, and overlanding was becoming a lot more popular. Plus, there was the usual Toyota tax taking place when people realized that these are now on the verge of becoming classic vehicles from an era when they were built to last a lifetime, but still had enough amenities to make them comfortable for a daily driver without being overloaded with tech and electronics like modern vehicles. Original low mileage examples were reaching six figures on Bring a Trailer. The 80 series was about $45,000 when new. Prices have started to level out and the 80 series Land Cruiser continues to be a solid investment. In April of 2020, I took a chance and purchased the cheapest imported 80 series Land Cruiser in the US for $9,500. It had been neglected, but I'm documenting all the steps to bring it back to its former glory. And I'll have links to those videos in the description as well as a comparison of the cool Japanese options on the 80 series that were never available in North America, like the Ice Cube Maker. As time would go on, the Land Cruiser would continue to evolve into more of a luxury SUV with the latest technology, isolating its passengers from the outside world, a far cry from its utilitarian roots. North American sales would continue to dwindle throughout the 2000s, selling just a few thousand units per year on average. Until late 2020, when Toyota announced that the 2021 would be the last year of the Land Cruiser to be sold in North America. While other parts of the world would be offered a 300 series, North America would have to wait until 2024 for their next Land Cruiser, the 250 series, or Prado as the rest of the world knows it. The Prado is the smaller, sportier Land Cruiser, but was never available in North America. This fresh start brings a smaller, less expensive, more utilitarian design to the US. Only time and sales figures will show if this new Land Cruiser has the same ideal balance of utilitarian ruggedness, comfort and luxury as the legendary 80 series. So if you already own an 80 series, post the year and model down in the comments and let us know how you like it. If you're in the market for an 80 series, I hope this video answers some questions. Do me a favor and give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful, that really helps the channel grow. Thanks for watching.